today I want to tell a little bit about Belisarius' War, the Roman Reconquest of Africa, AD 533-534. This is a game that covers uh, well the war against the Vandals that was uh, ordered by Justinian the first this guy here as part of, of his attempt to reconquest part of the Western Empire and Belisarius who is this guy here was the general that made it possible this is a game by decision games comes in a sleep Ziploc bag. Uh, it is a mini game, a very small game. Uh, it plays quickly, it is easy to learn, definitely a small game. It could work as an introductory war game. And even better than this, uh, it is based on a system that is shared by other games, by decision games, by other mini games. And as a matter of fact, because of this, I also played another game from the with the same system in conjunction with this one, that a game is called Caesar's War, and that is the game that I will cover in my next review. In any case, Belisario Swore, here is the map printed on thick paper. Uh, good looking and functional, I believe, with <coughs> some minor things here and there, some misprints, some things that really um, they are obviously wrong, at least they are obviously wrong, so then you know what to do about that. For example, fortresses are represented by towns surrounded by a hex. Here you have a hex which is empty. I imagine a town should have been printed in there because that is a fortress. I really believe it is. Uh, also because the rulebook says that there are five fortresses on the board. There are five axes. So that is one of them. What is one of the fortresses? Little things like that. Um, this is the setup of the game. The Vandals that will try to oppose the Roman invasion set up anywhere on the map with few restrictions. And I just place them in locations that I think it makes sense for them to be and at the beginning of the game the Romans start with a large group of forces there with Belisarius commanding the Roman army there are th three fleets there that are ready to transport the Roman units in various parts of the Mediterranean where the fight will take place this is a card-driven game. Each turn starts first with the Roman phase and then you have the Vandal phase and each player has a deck of cards. This is the, the Vandal deck, the Barbarian deck. At the beginning of your phase you simply draw a card and <clears throat> a card may have a recruit indication in that case you're gonna have a recruit phase in which you get to add new units uh, to the board and uh, in this game the barbarians do not have nearly as many recruits as the Romans the Romans bring in new people almost with every card so first you have that phase there then you move and the card tells you which of your units get to move that turn and by how many spaces on the board. For example, with this card, leaders, all leaders that you have on the board can move up to four spaces, regular cavalry up to four, irregulars up to three, and you get two fleet moves. Then you may also have modifications that apply to battle. But as you can see, this is a very simple engine. Uh, first, you're not sure of how many of your units you'll be able to move next turn and which units exactly. Once you get your movement allowance, then you execute your moves. For land moves, you move from location to location following the net of land connections. There are some restrictions, for example, when you enter mountains, you have to end movement. The same when you enter an area containing enemy units. Fleets are particularly important in this game, in which, indeed, units need to be moved from one side of the Mediterranean to the other. And then you can use fleet for movement. So the card tells you the number of spaces by which a land unit moves. Leaders 4 means a leader moves up to 4 spaces. But um, when it comes to fleets, the number that you find on the card indicates the number of fleets that get 
left to activate. So fleet two doesn't mean all of your fleets move by two spaces, but it means two fleets get to move. And before you move a fleet, you roll a die for that fleet, and that tells the number of spaces by which that fleet moves. Fleets always need to end movement in a port, and that means that there may be cases in which a fleet is actually not able to move or not to go where you want the fleet, the fleet to go. And fleets, of course, uh, can transport land units. That's one of the things that they do. A fleet may transport up to four land units each time that it moves. After you complete your movement, you need to resolve combat in all locations that contain units belonging to both players. Combat, well, you <clears throat> line up your units, you can remove them from the board if you want, you line up your units, then you need to roll a d6 for each player and that is used to determine battle advantage, which pretty much means initiative, it means who goes first. There are maybe modifiers, a leader gives you a plus one modifier on that roll, there may be cards that give you a modifier, you roll a die, and then the player that rolls the highest result gets initiative, if there is a tie, the Romans win initiative. The player with the initiative chooses one of his units and rolls an amount of d6s equal to the strength of the unit. In that case, that would be a 3. You roll the dice and you look at the results on the combat table. Here we have the combat table. Romans that are attacking would eliminate an enemy unit with a 6 and would panic an enemy unit with a 4 or a 5. Vandals and Moors take a 5 to panic a unit, 6 to eliminate. Elite units, those are identified by a plus, such as Belisarius, use this column here. And as you can see, they panic a unit with a 4, eliminate on 5 or 6. Units that are panicked need to retreat and do not get to attack for that combat. Now here we have a special situation if you're resolving combat here because that is a fortress and when you are resolving combat in a fortress the defenders in the fortress get to ignore panic results. Otherwise a panic result means that a unit that receives that result cannot attack this turn. It is flipped face down like that. So not all of your units may get to attack. In any case it is the owning player that decides the unit that takes the hit, that is removed or that is panicked. After you resolve the attack of the first unit that got to attack, if there still are defenders able to attack, then they attack following the same procedure. They roll dice equal to their uh, combat factor and they apply the result on enemy units that the <coughs> opponent gets to, gets to choose. And you go back and forth until one of the two sides doesn't have any, uh, any unit that is able to attack. So until a side only has panicked or eliminated units, at that point the panic units retreat and the units that are still in that space are the winners. There are also advanced rules that make the game more interesting and that I highly recommend using for, for your for, from your first game. They really do not have enough complexity to make it too complicated for anybody, I believe. Such rules are, for example, forced marching that allows units with a leader to move faster, but then you need to roll a die to see whether or not the unit is eliminated during the forced march. Uh, elite units, actually that is an advanced rule, but you should really use it because it is more fun. Push it after battle, if uh, a battle is won and the uh, winning side has cavalry, the cavalry can move by one space and can be used to uh, go after the enemy units that panicked. Roman camps, well you have a Roman camp in this game, in the other game I'm going to show you, Caesars War, you have more Roman camps. Roman camps are kind of neat uh, because, well first they give you supplies, that is units that are in there are not in, are not in need of supply, 
But then if when you're attacking a fortress you leave a unit in the camp, then that situation counts as a siege. So you need a camp adjacent to an enemy fortress. You need to leave a unit there, you attack the fortress, counts as a siege and you get to ignore the restriction about fortresses that means when you're attacking uh, during a siege defenders in the fortress do not get to ignore panic results another advanced rule that i really recommend using is supplies if you have more than two units in a single space then you need to roll for attrition for the extra units and um, there is a chance that those units will be eliminated units that are in camps or fortresses or in uh, spaces that contain a fleet do not have to roll for attrition. Victory conditions stipulate that the uh, Roman player wins if he controls all five fortresses on the map and these are one, two, three, four and five and, the, and at the same time Belisarius Belizar needs to be alive, needs to be on the map. That Vandal player wins if at the end of the game he controls at least two fortresses and his supreme leader Jellimer, who is that guy there, is still on the board. And yeah, the other result is a draw. Now, what do I think about this game? Um, I like it. I think it does what it advertises, what it is supposed to do, which is it gives you a mini game, which is easy to learn, quick to play, does give you a broad picture of, of the campaign, of the main events. Clearly, this is really bird eye view. But what is important here is that this, this is a game that is fun to play and it does have decisions that are important. Uh, the two sides play in very different ways. The Vandals are outnumbered, outgunned, uh, they do not stand much of a chance in open battle against the Romans but they have ways to deal with that because they have a huge territorial advantage. They are the ones that defend in fortresses which is good and they are the ones that also are far from the original area that the Romans are coming from. This fortress needs to be taken and the Roman has to uh, do some walking or some sailing to get there. In any case, uh, also considering how unreliable fleets may be, uh, there is some work there to be done. And there is a countdown clock which is not particularly generous. There are nine turns that the Roman player has to complete his mission and if the Roman loses momentum, if the Roman for example loses a crucial battle in Sardinia and the, um, and the Vandal player starts bringing reinforcements in there, that fortress can be particularly tough to take. Also taking this fortress can be tricky, while well, you could use a fleet or if you're marching from this direction using supply rules you cannot just stack a huge army here and then next turn you get there. You need to bring in there no more than two units, then they build a camp, then you have enough resources there and logistical advantage to be able to uh, bring an army and then to launch a powerful attack. There are just several things that make the game tricky for the Romans. I think overall the Romans have an advantage but they have lost. They have lost in games that I played. The game is absolutely solitaire friendly. It works as a perfect solitaire game because of the large amount of uncertainty that the cards give you. So in conclusion, Belisarius War, definitely a small game, quick game, easy game for two experienced players. It can be a sort of a filler in a, in a much longer game night, but I think it is overall a good game, a good mini game. It does not disappoint, of course, depending on the set of expectations that you have, and I think when you pick up a mini game such as this one, you should have a specific set of expectations, in which case uh, it does not disappoint. Quick, fast, fun, with interesting decisions, with moments of surprise, with moments of tension when uh, there is an action that has been built up through several turns and then finally gets to be resolved. Fun, fun game overall. I definitely got enough bang for my buck here to make the purchase of the game worth it and so all in all Belisarius War is a game that I'm happy to have in my collection.